but I see uh, 3D homes being able to fit a whole bunch of uh, variety of needs when it comes to this uh, smaller affordable housing conversation that we're having. Is 3D printing the future of construction? Join us as we discuss this and more on 3D Print the Future with your host, Frank Awesome. My guest today joins us from Ontario, Canada. A graduate of both Yorkville and Carleton Universities, she is a serial entrepreneur with her sights set firmly on making the world a better place. And she is the owner and CEO at Kelford Youth Services, co-chair at National Alliance to End Rural and Remote Homelessness, and chair of Cornerstone Landing Youth Services. She's an active advocate for youth services and safe housing for youth. Please welcome Carolee Culford. How are you doing, Carolee? I'm oh, good. How are you? Doing great. Um, I'm just so ecstatic to have you on the show um, because while this is a show really about 3D printing, which is kind of a technology, we really feel so strongly that this is one of these technologies that once we break it into the market can not only help one sort of sector of one industry, like, like just building cheap houses, but we can really put our energies toward a lot more things if we can get this going and one of and a lot of those things have a lot to do with with building houses and your experience in life has been completely around how do we make housing equitable for everybody and not just for people with money um so tell me a little bit about what you know as a youth did you have these these sorts of issues that brought you into this or was this something that you kind of noticed as an adult and are now sort of fighting for. Right. I think probably it was my parents who showed me uh, what it was like for uh, people around us to struggle with poverty. My mother was a teacher and a principal. Oh, wow. And so she was kind of one of those folks who fought for the underdog. So she would come home with stories of, you know, kids in poverty and, and, uh, and we certainly had, you know, we had, we had extended family members live with us in foster care. And, you know, there was always some cousin living with us at some point <laughs> for some reason. So, um, sometimes just for a job, but, uh, you know, having people around and knowing that there was, uh, you know, poverty and abuse and mental health issues in people's lives was something that I grew up around and just knowing about. And so I think I knew very, very young when I was in high school that I was um, going to want to work with uh, young people specifically, but also just in the uh, helping profession of some sort. So, um, so I very young, I started counseling as a volunteer, uh, providing support to uh, young victims of sexual abuse. And then it just kind of evolved from there. I got jobs and I did a degree in psychology. And so how, um, uh, how young were you when you started counseling the child, the, the kids, the youth, what was your, what age were you at there? Well, I started I started as a peer volunteer, actually. So I was about 19, I think, when I started my first uh, support group um, with another counselor. What was that like? Like, what, what, what kind of... Like, you, uh, know, you know, looking back now, I feel like I knew nothing. I was so... Uh, obviously, I was really lucky to have, uh, you know, a mentor who uh, was a therapist who kind of said, yeah, no, I'd love to have sort of a peer uh, support person as well. And so uh, anyway, so she kind of took me under her wing. So uh, it's probably thankfully to her in large part that I'm, I'm doing some of the work I'm doing for sure. So including around youth homelessness, but um, yeah, so she, uh, she allowed me to sort of sit in on groups with her as a co as a co facilitator. And uh, so looking back now, I feel like I was really young, but at the time, <laughs> I thought I was doing okay. So it's amazing what you learn over time. It, sound, it sounded like you were kind of young there. So tell us about your med. This is kind of interesting, because this, this really is what what drives all of our passions to, to when, when somebody is entrepreneurial in spirit, but not yeah. monetary in mind, you're, you're, you're right. doing it because you know that you can help people. This is a whole other mindset. Yeah. Well, and I have an interesting background that kind of intersects how, like my father was a contractor. My brother's a real estate agent. I actually did real estate for a few years as well, just as a, I call it my mental health break. So, um, and at the same time I was always doing, uh, work with youth and, and counseling. So, um, which, you know, clearly my path has just led me to this whole housing and homelessness piece. But, um, but yeah, I, I actually got a job in a residential treatment center for children when I was 22 years old and finishing up my degree. And about a year after that, the province of Ontario announced that they were going to privatize the child welfare system. And so essentially they closed down all government operated, uh, facilities, so foster care, uh, group homes, those sorts of things for kids. So I, I had a choice. I either had to open my own or go work for a private operator because I loved it. Like it was my, as soon as I walked in, my, I remember my first shift to this day when I was 22 and I loved it. I loved working with the kids. Uh, I loved the environment and uh, just being able to spend that, you know, 24 hours with them and, and hang out and have dinners and, and yet have really tough conversations and work through tough stuff with them. But um, so I opened my own. So at 24, I bought a house, power of sale. Um, <laughs> that was my first entrance into the real estate game because nobody's going to rent to a group home. So you had to buy a house. Um, and then I had to go through all the zoning amendments. So there was no bylaws to permit group homes. And so I had to do a 
a whole um, official plan uh, uh, amendment and, and site-specific zoning amendment. I had to go to an OMB Ontario Municipal Board hearing to get the site-specific zoning to allow for this group home. So that was my introduction at 24 years old, having to go to, to this court case to rezone a property. Yeah, but for a social cause, right? Which is really interesting for me because that's kind of the the history that I took and uh, the experience I took into the conversation about tiny homes and planning legislation and, and uh, building codes. So, um, you know, that started for me way back at 24 and then uh, is, is serving me well now <laughs> in it terms of the work I'm trying to, to run tiny houses. So, yeah. So, I mean, in a, in a strange way, I've always been involved uh, with youth, with counseling, but also housing because we were providing housing to young people. So, um, and it was because of that work with the child welfare system that we set up a uh, community coalition to actually support young people who couldn't access the services of a child welfare agency, but who were also struggling with housing and homelessness. So, um, so that was a good 20 years ago in Lanark County, and it's evolved now into a nonprofit charity that's called Cornerstone Landing Youth Services. So, so we support about 75 or 85 young people across the county of Lanark with um, either homelessness or housing insecurity and provide them with supports to keep them housed. Now, do you target, uh, like when you're talking about homeless children, are you talking about, you know, orphans? Or are you talking about actual, you know, street urchins? I hate, you know, I shouldn't have used that term, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I like English humor, um, I guess. But, you know, like that sort of, you know, so are you targeting or are people coming to you? How is that working? Well, both. So we started as volunteers that uh, we were just a board and we were a working board because we didn't have any money for staff at the time, but um, we were all connected through social services with youth anyways. And so pretty much we knew that there was kids out there, which is why we started the program to begin with. But um, so, you know, word of mouth and uh, just access to other agencies who would refer kids to us. So um, we started really small. Like I think we supported about seven or eight kids in our first year and then we got some funding and some grants started coming in. So, so now we have uh, two uh, full-time staff that support kids between the ages of 16 and 24 awesome. um, and so their backgrounds are really diverse like it's either the you know the young person who's been struggling with homelessness since they were 11 or 12 years old first episode of homelessness right um, but children under the age of 16 have to be referred to the child welfare agency so we don't typically support that many kids who are under the age of 16 um, so most of the kids are between 16 to 24 and again their backgrounds really vary from having been extensively homeless off and on with their families without their families for a long time um, and then also just young people who have you know decided by 16 17 they just can't cope at home anymore and need to be on their own so yeah a whole variety of stories for sure i definitely uh, I, I can definitely relate like i was telling you before i was i left home when i was 13 my family moved around a lot um, i was on the street for for a couple of years until i was 16 and at which point uh, I had a friend whose mom was a psychiatrist and she picked up that I was living on the streets. I was living pretty comfortably on the streets, mind you, but yeah. uh, she sent me to social services and I ended up in a foster home, but, you know, in and out and just housing for me was never something that was solid. I never had roots and I know that there are so many people out there and it's not because I didn't want to, it's not because the desire wasn't there, right? It's because the facilities aren't there. We can't do things quick enough fast enough you know policy gets in the way so yep. what are you up to right now um i don't know if you want to describe everything all of your institutions are up to <laughs> perhaps maybe just the just your your own personal business but what, what are you guys up to like what directives are you following right now and what sort of things are you doing yeah, so in Lanark County, specifically with Cornerstone Landing Youth Services, we adopted a Housing First model a few years ago. So we've seen great results as a result of that. So Housing First means that you are providing people housing as a right. So there's no deciding whether they're ready for housing, not ready for housing. You're just assuming that people need housing and should have housing and finding them housing right away. And then wrapping them in supports while they're there. So what do they need to maintain that housing? So that's really the basis for our program at Cornerstone. And, and it's worked really well, even for young people. So, you know, we have lots of resistance. If you say to people, you know, uh, the 16 year old, we're gonna find you know, them a, an apartment. And lots of people are like, 16 is too young to have an apartment. They can't have an apartment. Well, that is their alternative. And quite frankly, they do it. And we, we have 16, 17 year olds all across this county, very successfully living on their own with supports in place um, and if they have the right financial support and a roof over their head and stability um, they finish school they get they graduate and they move on to college university and get jobs which is what we want for them right so yeah. Um, so yeah you just have to kind of, kind of faith that kids are quite resilient and actually can take care of themselves quite well with supports in place so so true uh, yeah so you just have to have faith that they can do it um, so, but we also uh, are working now on, on affordable housing because one of the things we're struggling with, and I think all of us right across Canada are struggling with, is affordable housing. And so we, we're, we're putting out about 
$30,000 a year and run supplements right now to support kids in apartments, um, just in Lanark County alone, and that's all fundraised dollars. So with COVID this year, we've lost a couple of our major fundraisers, so we're really nervous that in a year we won't have that $30,000 to support the kids, um, which is a little scary to us. Uh, and so we uh, started looking at purchasing our own properties, and so that's how I got into the tiny home game, was mm -hmm. because in a rural looking for affordable housing we didn't want to look at 10 and 20 unit buildings we actually just want small units with two and three units in it each um, and so in Ontario the planning act was also in the process of changing to accommodate what's called secondary units and so you're allowed to have a single family home and put a small apartment in it and then also have a detached apartment in your backyard or side yard as well and so we really sort of grabbed onto that and started uh, meeting with our, doing presentations before our local municipalities to say, please update your bylaws uh, to accommodate secondary units because we could then purchase a single family home, put an apartment in it and use a tiny home in the backyard as a, as a third unit as well. So one single family home becomes three units for us. Um, and so that just made sense for us uh, from a rural perspective, from a funding perspective, because if we have to fundraise a down payment, we can do that because we're not going to get multi-million dollar grants to buy housing here. So, um, so it was kind of just the, the best of both worlds for us. But, but it opened up this whole conversation about tiny homes and, uh, and I research and, and looking into that and, and, uh, and started to recognize actually that tiny homes is not a new concept. It's an old concept. Yes, it is. That we yeah. have created barriers and restrictions yep. around to the point where we've pretty much ruled it out. So, yep. So part of it is looking at it as an old concept that we need to revive because of this affordable housing crisis we have right now. So, um, so that's kind of the perspective we came at. So we, we partnered with Algonquin College in Perth right. and very similar to your 3D project, I think that you're going to be trying to do. Um, we, uh, we did it as a pilot project with Algonquin College. So when we heard all these restrictions and barriers and stereotypes around tiny homes on wheels, we uh, partnered with Algonquin to, to, to build one tiny home as a pilot project. And so that's what we looked at it as. And uh, so we wanted to challenge all these uh, stereotypes around you can't build a house on a trailer to code. And we did, and we went above code. Um, and so we, uh, and then at the same time, we were addressing some of the barriers around planning and legislation. So at the same right. time it was being built in a warehouse at Algonquin, I was out doing presentations to councils to see if we could get the uh, bylaws changed to accommodate them too. So, so we've had some movement in terms of the municipals uh, and municipalities and their bylaws, uh, not as much as I'd like to see two and a half years later after trying to push for this, but, but Tiny home is built and unfortunately is not being used because of the planning barriers right now, but we're still uh, we're still pushing. So so as soon as we buy our, our first single family home, our tiny home will be used as a secondary unit uh, in the backyard. So that's beautiful. And advocacy, I'm glad you touched on that because um, we feel, I mean, we're probably 75% of our efforts right now are spent on advocacy. Uh, yeah. More than half our team is spent every day on advocacy, writing letters, talk, even yeah. I've spoken to my MP about, you know, why do we have to have all these restrictions on this old technology that we can now do way better? Yeah. Now, another thing you touched on that I, I'm probably going to get you to, to, to talk about a little bit is the idea of the subsidy or the supplement. Yes. I'm yeah. way against that. I, don't, don't get me wrong. I applaud every effort you make to get up in the morning, have a cup of coffee and do what you do. We love that. Uh, but I don't feel like, I feel like the subsidy of the supplement is, is, is a solution that needs to, to, to we, we can't keep looking at that as a solution because I don't think it's a, it's a solution any more than putting a bandaid on a cut actually heals the cut. Right. Um, we need something more solid than that. And that runs right along with why, why do we have to subsidize things? It's because things are too expensive. So the people with the money have to give money to an organization who can then subsidize the people without the money to have something that they're pretty much entitled to, to begin with. Yes, so why do yeah. we do that? Well, we do that because there are corporations and companies out there building houses and stuff. who don't care about that. They just care about the bottom line and the profits. We want, we want to change that. We want to make an industry so cheap and so inexpensive that we get our profits and we can offer homes to people without having to pull money to then subsidize these things. They're affording it all on their own hundred percent. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, so in, a lot of your work is in this sort of subsidy, subsidy, uh, area. So what do you see that? How, how is that? Is it as easy as I make it sound? Well, no, I don't think it's easy, but I do agree with you. I totally agree a hundred percent. Actually. Uh, it's one of the reasons why we're looking at purchasing our own properties because we're like, mm -hmm. why are we fundraising from the community to give, uh, rent subsidies to private landlords who keep increasing their rents to the point where we can't fundraise enough to keep up with it anymore. And so the, I, 
I, it doesn't make me popular when I talk about this, but I don't ever want to rely on the private sector for housing, <laughs> quite frankly. And I want to advocate for people to be able to get back in the housing game themselves if they want to. So again, the fact that we've priced housing out of the market for the majority of our population is sad. We have young people staying home until their 30s now because they can't afford their own house. Um, if you talk to young people in their mid-20s, they'll say, I don't think I'll ever own a house because I'll never be able to afford it. Uh, saving up the money for the down payment alone is impossible for me, so I'm just not even going to consider it. But the more we rely on the private market, Market, I think the less uh, control we have to be able to manage prices and so right now in Leonard County alone we have two kids sharing a bedroom and paying $900 a month for one room in a house $900 a month <laughs> to share a room so and that's that's getting pretty common like even in little Leonard County rural Leonard County we're seeing you know 20 people showing up for one apartment showing and one bedrooms renting for a thousand and eleven hundred dollars a month and so if you're 16 years old and you're only getting seven hundred and thirty dollars a month for your food and your housing it's impossible your rent is like four hundred dollars a month more so, and we have lots of young people working part-time jobs as well, but to go to school full-time and work part-time and take care of an entire household yourself, <laughs> I mean, those are expectations we don't have for the, for the strongest and most resilient of families who are doing well. So why do we have these expectations for these young people who are struggling to keep their head above water? So, um, so I don't think the rent subsidy is a long-term plan, but I think the, there's lots of people at a national level that would disagree with me. Certainly personal housing benefit is something that the federal government has uh, has launched as part of the national housing strategy. Um, well, they don't benefit from it, right? I mean, there's a certain amount of taxes that change hands when that money goes back and forth. Am I right? Or is that? Somehow... Well, the personal housing subsidy typically goes to people who are on lower incomes to begin with. And so uh, it really, what it does is it just allows them the flexibility, which I agree. And I think people should have flexibility where they live. I don't think people should be forced to have to live in a housing development of some sort. So the port the idea behind the philosophy behind the um, portable housing benefit is that it travels with the person. So the person can say, I want to live in that building over there. So here's the rent subsidy, or I want to live in that community over there. Um, because what's happened is we've created sort of these, uh, you know, poverty neighborhoods that people can't seem to get out of, right? And so to allow people flexibility and to blend into different communities um, prevents you from having rich communities and poor communities, right? It allows more flexibility. However, um, as the house prices go up, you have to then adjust the subsidies to go up, right? So, um, so I. I would rather see, again, uh, more people have the flexibility of choosing their housing on their own personal merit um, and also being able to buy a house. I think we need more flexibility about that. So I agree with you 100%. All that to say, I agree with you 100%. We need to get prices down. We need more affordable options for folks, um, which is really where the whole secondary unit, tiny home kind of conversation came in because people were looking for more affordable housing options and they weren't as concerned about size. They just wanted to have their own space that they had a right to. Um, and so that's really how those two worlds all came together for us, homelessness and housing and affordable housing, and then flexibility in terms of what housing types were offering. So, which is why when I, you know, got the message about uh, uh, getting involved in a 3D uh, print project for affordable housing was, uh, was cool. Well, these are, you know, these are our people, you know, we, we, uh, we, we love the tiny home crowd, not because they just seem like, you know, have a little more common sense to others. I could be a little biased on that, but um, because these are the kind of folk who would rather be outside than inside. Yeah. Um, who would rather see a huge piece of land like behind me with a beautiful space outside and just enough space to live on the inside when the weather gets, gets down or when you need to hunker down. Um, a smart space, um, you know, a space that you could build three of these for the price of a single more brick and mortar house on one of those plots, you know, so the yeah. economy goes up. You've got, now you can imagine behind me, there's, there's mom and dad in the big one, grandma and grandpa in the middle one. And then the, the two kids, you know, roomies in, in the other one. And now they got a whole family there. Everything's been paid for. They designed it on their own. It feels like home, the shapes and what they're looking at. It's theirs. It's not something they found in a catalog and it wasn't decided by um, a community group, which is something that I just absolutely abhor. Um, yeah. Th so these are, I, I kind of, I kind of waxing a little bit, but these are some of the hurdles we kind of have to overcome other than just the technology. And it, it comes back to advocacy is how do we convince the other half that a neighborhood where all the houses are green, except every fifth house is red. Why is that good? Why is right. that cool? How is that aesthetic? Mm -hmm. um, to me, it's just so many loaves of bread in a shopping store that's just all duck, 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 put in a line. When you see these aerial, aerial shots of these neighborhoods, it's just the same roof in different colors, one right. after another. Yeah. 
Um, one's lighter, one's darker, and there's no individuality. So it takes the beauty away from the earth. It, it doesn't provide economical housing. These things are expensive. They don't last very long. Um, they're, you know, they're, exp and pe most people can't afford them anyway. So when you get into it, now you're just sort of in that sardine can. Um, uh, so I think we got to attack the problem right from the beginning is attack the attitudes towards what, what living is now and how do we think that we could be better in the future by, by doing it in the future better. So by building houses that match the landscape rather than the ideals of some, you know, three people on a board, some somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, so your interest in 3d printing is where, where did that come from for you? Uh, I think from a call from you guys. <laughs> was it just the, was it, was it the, the dead just call you and say, Hey, we're doing this uh, and you're doing tiny homes or was it, you didn't say. Uh... Well, there's actually a mutual colleague, a colleague that's in the housing sector. Uh, Jeff Morrison actually connected us. Oh, and so okay. Worlds came together, but, um, but I mean, I joke about that, but ever since I uh, started advocating for tiny homes and all its various formats, um, I get sent links to housing all the time. Have you seen this tiny home community? I've seen this tiny home. And so I've had many, many, many links to 3D printed homes sent to me over the last two to three years. So um, from around the world, you know, people saying, what about this? Um, and interestingly for me, because I, I kind of take like a I try to be really realistic about it. I want to know how to make legal affordable housing as well. Um, and that's where the tiny home on wheels crowd sort of gets lost in the conversation because according to building code, there is no way to have a, a permanent residence on wheels. You actually have to be fixed to a foundation. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, things like that interest me because I want to figure out solutions to that. Is there a process? Is there a code? Is there something we need to change to, to adapt to that? But um, so for me, I think, uh, again, it's about affordability. Uh, it's about how these building models fit into planning and code um, so that we can make them viable for as many people as possible. And so when I think about 3D printed homes, it's very similar to the tiny home on, on wheels conversation uh, because I think there could be flexibility in it. If you can print off a 400 square foot, uh, you know, secondary unit in somebody's backyard, um, it might be... Uh, you know, obviously faster uh, process and more economical for people. So I just had a call in Ottawa um, from a neighbor, believe it or not, who wants to put in a secondary unit for uh, one of their sons. So, um, and so he was talking about the city bylaws and, and all the uh, requirements they were having, hoops they were having to jump to, to make it happen. But I was excited to, to realize that we might have a secondary unit detached in our, in our own neighborhood right beside me. So I'm like, good, that's what I'm championing the cause of. But so I see, and maybe I'm wrong in this, perhaps you can correct me, but I see uh, 3D homes being able to fit a whole bunch of uh, variety of needs when it comes to this uh, smaller affordable housing conversation that we're having. So. Oh, we, we agree 100%. Um, but I want to make clear <clears throat> that we don't, uh, we're not against uh, any other kind of tiny homes, whether it be sea cans or modular mm -hmm. or some companies are 3D printing in foam. Um, we are for every single one of these technologies and we're for every single one of these technologies succeeding because the success is not for us. The success is for moving humanity forward, which is something that, you know, industry leaders, anybody that can make themselves an industry leader, I think it's our responsibility to, to be thought leaders and to say, look, let's get out of this old paradigm because it's just not working. Even the things, some, a lot of things we think are working, is it working because it's working or is it working because we've gotten used to it? Now my I'm half blind. I can drive. I can do lots of things because I've gotten used to it. It might be yeah. a bit the same thing. We're kind of running through this half blind, just being okay with it. And I got to a point when I hit my 40s, I was like, okay, I'm not okay with this anymore. And then, you know, 47, 40, 46, I turned, you know, and 3D printing came along and said, okay, look, now there's a solution. Why isn't anybody doing this? And then I found out that people were and realized, okay, well, we can do this. Um, so I don't want to take away from any of the other industries that are trying to solve the same problems we are because working together will do it much better. But you're right. Um, we can print foundations in place and we can print a foundation at any shape. Um, for example, if we go with a robotic arm printer, we can print right next, you know, the, 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 the legal space from a fence without putting any infrastructure up or even bothering the neighbors. And we can do it in a day or two. So if we got to bother the neighbors, we say, okay, we're going to be in here for 48 hours. We'll get it signed and we're gone. You know, it's not two yeah. weeks of construction, which for a tiny home, what they're great, you know, but it's still, still got to build it, either build it in some warehouse and have it shipped mm -hmm. and then, or yeah. you got to build it on in place. We could come in and just print it. 
and then the only yeah. work is another day of of lining and, and doing you know whatever electrical stuff that that happens yeah and in terms of the conversation around affordable housing that's one of the issues that we're struggling with in canada right now is a lot of the contracts to build affordable housing were 25 to 30 years ago and those contracts are running out um but there also wasn't enough funding provided to do the maintenance required and so even in lanark county for example we lost uh, you know 60 units of housing because after three years they had to be torn down and so, uh, you know, then you got to come up with the millions of dollars to rebuild it again. So you're going backwards as much as you're going forwards right now across Canada. It's one of the reasons why we have a housing crisis because we're losing almost as many units as we're building right now. Um, so you will see announcements for new housing all the time, but, uh, but we're also losing units all the time too. Yeah. So if we could actually solve that problem so that we're actually building inventory, not losing inventory, <laughs> we would be ahead of the game right now. That's super interesting. Attrition has never come up in any conversations I've ever had about housing. And that's, wow. Like, Talk about uh, you know the, the little needle that's pricking your skin that you can't find that little sliver you can't find yeah. attrition of homes. I never ever considered that, yeah. and that's changing my outlook a little bit right now. Um, that's yeah. really interesting. So I, I really do like to sort of keep steering this towards the you know the three D printing area yeah, um, because I do think that it can solve all of your all of the things that you're working towards. We you yeah. know you could use it as your hammer and nail and just bolt forward with it unfortunately there's a lot of issues we have to solve a lot of a lot of obstacles we need to overcome um but assuming that we solve all the physics let's mm -hmm. say we please all the politicians and they're all like we love you guys you're awesome let's do everything you say can you see this being a welcome solution to the world's housing crisis now not just in canada but can you see this in you know 50 years or even 100 years from now being sort of the normal way that we deal with housing crisis uh, well, to be honest, I probably don't know enough about the technology, but I think if anybody could come up with an affordable, long-term, um, sustainable solution, uh, that's, you know, I also believe in smaller housing. I think that's part of the issue too, lowering footprints on the, on the, on the planet as well. So I think if you can meet those, tick all those boxes, I think, you know, why would anybody object? So yeah, now I'm saying that I also know that, you know, people have fought me pretty hard on tiny homes and although the, you know, the conversations evolving and attitudes are changing um, anything new or perceived as new is always challenged right so um, you know I think that's going to be the the biggest hurdle is just to uh, prove that it can last 200 years when there hasn't mm. been one yet that's lasted 200 years and it'll take 200 years for us to do that <laughs> yeah do you know what's changing the conversation thing too is that there's more and more people like you know when you talk about homelessness there's all kinds of stereotypes you know uh, it brings out the worst in people when you have conversations about homelessness but, it can. <laughs> and why you're homeless, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but what's changing the conversation I find is that a broader audience is requiring and wanting smaller, more affordable housing options. And so the broader the audience, the more will you have to create solutions for that, right? So for example, seniors on fixed incomes only have about $500 a month for housing. So when you say publicly that we've got thousands of senior single ladies and men in this province who are on the verge of homelessness because they can't afford housing anymore, um, that's a big powerful group of voices who can advocate for more solutions. And so same for parents who have children with disabilities who want an independence type oriented housing option for young people. Um, you know, they're a big, strong force that can advocate for these solutions. So I think when the conversation becomes broader, which is really how I went about it ultimately, I said, look, this isn't going to just help youth. This is going to help all of these other groups. Um, then, you know, the conversation started to evolve. And now I get stories all the time. I get people calling me saying, I, I want to put a tiny house on a piece of land I have. Do you have any? suggestions for how to go about the bylaws um and so that helps so i think you have to get past that hurdle first right you need to change the conversation to make it broader mm -hmm. so i think you probably have that in your favor because i think lots of people across canada right now are looking for more affordable um, greener options for housing um, and I think the speed of which you can build is going to be a huge asset as well, right? I think that's one of the frustrations too now is that, you know, it takes a year to build a, you know, a secondary unit in someone's backyard, which seems so silly. So um, our tiny home is home, 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 six square feet. Um, and we actually just built it for uh, short-term housing, not long-term housing. But, um, and it took about five, six months. We thought we could knock it out in about 60 days and it took almost five, six months to do it so, from top to bottom. It so, takes longer than people um, think from start to finish yeah for sure yeah and we we luckily we had algonquin's indoor warehouse space so we could build it over the winter inside but uh but yeah it was definitely uh, shocking to us we thought we would have it done by christmas and it was like july by the time we rolled it out the next year so um so i think if you can get past those hurdles absolutely why would why would anybody in the world not uh, not look forward to that kind of solution right i think we're desperate for sustainable 
green affordable solutions. So, so has this kind of changed your mind? You've just obviously just been recently introduced to 3D printing as construction to begin with. Um, do you, has this sort of changed your outlook on what you're going to do with your businesses and like how you're going to help the youth and, you know, has it made you sort of go, well, maybe, uh, you know, a tiny home on wheels isn't the way to go. Are you sincere, seriously looking at 3D printing as one of your personal solutions? Well, I'm curious to follow along because I, I mean, there's, I have no objections to it based on the way it's been described to me. I, I can't imagine why I would have any objections. What I'm always curious to learn, because I like to learn as well, is just how it's going to fit within codes and, and how you're going to meet all those uh, requirements. And, and I, I'm looking at you know, this picture behind you of the three houses on one property and all like all my brain is screaming going, that's a planning problem. You're not going to get three houses approved on one piece of land in Canada. These <laughs> so. are real, actually, um, built yeah. by SQ4D. I like I'm curious about that piece because I think the more look at the more industries we have whether it's 3D printing tiny home movement whatever it is that's fighting for the same planning principles right. and the same code requirements mm -hmm. the more strength we have which is kind of what I'm referring to when I say broadening conversation right I think the more people we have pushing for these things the better so um, and look at I think you know people are interested I think you just have to present them with the with the reality I, the one reason why I think the tiny home on wheels industry is still struggling is because because people are looking for affordable options uh, there's lots of them who who are not meeting codes and don't want to. They kind of just want to fly under the radar, be off the grid, um, and park their house on a you know on wheel somewhere on a remote lot somewhere. Uh, the unfortunate part for that is you can't like you can't advocate for an industry if it's not a legal industry. And so it's a bit of a balance between trying to figure out how you meet those both of those needs. So how do you make it affordable but also make it legal? Um, and so uh, you know that's and that's kind of the conversation I try to walk down the middle of. I understand why people want this, but I also understand that we need to find a way to make them legal so more right. people can have it. Um, so people are kind of always flying under the radar with these little secret tiny homes running around. <laughs> it's well, we've actually kind of given some consideration to that. And we realized that um, the codes have to be kind of different uh, for a 3D printed tiny house or any tiny house for rural or non-rural, right? So I think that's, probably one of the biggest challenges they're coming they're trying to make up rules for two different things because they think it's the same thing so you're not really just building a tiny home you're building a tiny home in the city on a you know it's a granny house behind someone's house in the city with utilities and all this wonderful stuff or you're just putting some on your own plot of land there has to be different rules for that is that something you guys consider yeah, well, and so, because we are in rural, right? So, and uh, and yet the biggest uptake for secondary units, which are primarily tiny homes on a property, right? Um, not on wheels, but typically, you know, slab on grade gotcha. um, in a city. Uh, they actually, the urban centers have a, a bigger uptake for it um, than rural communities do right now. Rural communities are actually giving us a harder time planning wise than urban centers are. Really? So urban centers are looking at things like laneway housing and, and uh, you know, yeah. garden suites secondary units and that sort of stuff. So yeah, the rural communities are uh, definitely dragging their heels, in my opinion, in terms of approving these things. We have some rural townships are like all over it. Tay Valley Township, for example, in our area was like the first, they were all over it. So they're very uh, accepting of these new creative sort of models for housing and secondary units and multiple houses on one property, which is great. Yep, a lot of, lot of slow conversations Weird. happening. Do you think that's indicative of the people that live there? Or do you think that's because the leaders are just deciding like a community association, they're deciding what's best for the community. So what do you think? Do you think it's the people that are of that opinion? Or do you think it's more well, of a rural community? I think you're, you're relying on rural municipalities. So, you know, you're going to have five or six people who've been elected officials to make these decisions around official plans and zoning bylaws. And, and you do have planners typically hired or shared amongst different townships and stuff in small communities. But um, so it depends on their philosophy and that personal attitudes as well. Right. Yeah. So yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Um, and, and a lot of, there's a lot of disconnection between the different ministries as well. So, you know, people who are planners don't necessarily understand building codes. So I heard from planners all the time that the minimum square footage required in the code for housing was six or 700 square feet because that's what their bylaw was drafted as. They were shocked to find out that the minimum square footage for uh, a single family home in Ontario, according to the code, is 145 square feet plus a, plus a washroom and laundry. 145 square feet? That blew <laughs> me away just floor. now. What? <laughs> Plus a washroom and laundry. So, oh my yeah, so you can, so that's why our house at 196 square feet meets code. And so we did, we did everything to meet code with that. 
So, uh, but you will find minimum square footages in towns as high as a thousand square feet. You are legally not allowed to build a house smaller than a thousand square feet. Even though a lot of those rural communities are full of wartime houses that were built in the forties, which were four or 500 square feet when they were first built. So um, yeah, so over time we kind of developed this bigger is better mantra. And so I think, uh, and, and we're communities as we are in urban centers, I think, right? So. And then people worry about property values and all this sort of stuff. So you have to go through all those kind of hoops, right? Which, which you will hear as well. So if you have, you know, if you become the first community to have a 3D printed house, you're going to have neighbors say, how's that affect my property values? <laughs> right? They so, are. And that's where I think we've really got to be really careful about, about, uh, about aesthetics when we do these things. It can't look like some of the ones that be printed, you know, like, you know, in, a, in, in Ecuador where they are, to me, these are just some of the most beautiful buildings I've ever seen. Yeah. Uh, to a layman, they look like somebody just slapped mud on, in layers on top of each other and put some wood roof right. on top, <laughs> right? They see the, the steel struts right. holding the roof up and think to themselves, oh, we can't even hold up a roof. Like, no, this is, you know. Um, so I think we have to go past doing it in, in a way that's just very economical and works and go past that and work with, you know, with the land work with the area. So if you go into an area of the city and do a granny house where most of the houses fall into the white gray category in stucco, mm -hmm. uh, which is pretty common for yards, for your areas with yards, with big yards. So uh, we're going to go in there and we're going to print or at least cover what we print in a material that sort of matches that. Mm -hmm. If we're out in somebody's, by somebody's lake and it's really hilly, we might print them hobbit holes, mm -hmm. you know, to go completely on the other side of the spectrum. Right. Yeah. So the idea to get acceptance, I think you hit the nail on the head is not, they're not so worried about how they're going to last a thousand years, but how is that going to affect my property value? You know, is yeah. it going to make the property value in the neighborhood go up? And I think it's going to make it go up. I don't know anything about it, but I can't see putting something as an added value service. That's how I make a little more money. I give added value services. I, I give my main services for, for a decent price. And then anything extra I do is, is value added and I make extra on that. And that's to yeah. me what this is all about. So how could that possibly yeah. make, am I wrong about that? Is there any possible way that uh, a 3D printed home or any tiny home could drop the price? The, 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 that, this doesn't make any sense to me the more I talk about it. Well, so as a single family home, uh, you know, you would certainly get some argument even from realtors. Um, I always find realtors, my brother's a realtor. I love him. He's the most honest man I've ever met and he does all my real estate for me. Um, but uh, there are some other realtors, not so much. <laughs> they, okay. they tend to tell people, you know, what they want to hear. So if I hear one more time from a realtor told me that this could devalue my house, uh, I want to pull my hair out. But, and I also was a realtor for a while. So I'm like, it's just not true. So, but realistically, when but, you do that, what actually happens? No, and I actually have for tiny homes because that was one of the first things I heard was you know if you put a tiny house beside my big house it's going to lower my property values and so we kind of skirted that by having the secondary unit conversation and just saying that look at uh, if you pull a, put a secondary unit in your backyard um, you're gonna have to pull a building permit and the building permit is going to flag an assessment of your property and chances are your taxes are going to go up because you have an additional oh. uh, property but if your taxes go up it means the value of your house has gone up and the value of your house has gone up that means the value of your neighbor's houses have gone up because that's how house sales work. It's about average sale prices in the house. So you never want to be the most expensive house in the neighborhood. You want to be in the middle or the bottom because you're going to be pulled up by all the other houses. So if your house goes up in value through a tax assessment, it means that everybody's house is potentially going to go up. So there is no argument to say that a secondary unit is going to devalue your, your property. That's just not true. But it does cause so, other challenges. But you will, yeah, get increased taxes for sure. But in this kind of a housing market, really, I mean, the, the extra $100 a month you might pay in your taxes is going to be made up for by the rental income or the family member that can stay there, you know, contribute towards the cost. So anyways, that, there's not much of an argument there for me. I mean, I had to go through that when I was 24. I was 24 years old and had to look up group homes across North America and how that was affecting property values. And there was all kinds of research out there to show that a group home next door to you does not devalue the, the property values um, because one house, one building does not have an overall effect on the entire neighborhood. It's actually the, the opposite. The entire neighborhood has an effect on that property. So um, anyways, I, I think it's an interesting, I think there's an argument for all of this. And I think there's enough cases out there with unique houses, new houses that you can uh, address all of these barriers as they come up. And I think I'm guessing that the 3D conversation is going to be almost identical to the conversation we've had to have about tiny homes, which is why I'm really interested in, in uh, being involved in some level. So I agree entirely. Um, and uh, you know what, uh, we're going to have to talk about this again, I think in three or four months. 
after yeah. uh, we've gotten a little bit further on. We've got some pretty good news coming up in the next month or so that I can't talk about now, but I can't wait to share the news um, and then see where we're at because I, I know this is new for you as well. Um, and uh, we'll have to have a talk and see if either of us have made any any progress. I'll be interested to hear if you're if, if you got that land and you, and you got that stuff up, especially if you've then contacted us to go ahead and print your 3D home on there. That would be just fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think that's I think we're gonna they're gonna end it for today. Um, just to, just to keep it nice and light. Uh, I want to thank everybody who's come and listened to the show. I hope you guys really found that interesting. Um, it's something that we're really going to have to look forward to if we're going to do 3D printed housing at all. It's not just about the technology. It's also about the advocacy. So we've got to get the message out there, share the word, let everybody know that we can solve not just a few problems, but a lot of problems with this. Uh, of course, don't forget to hit the subscribe button, uh, hit the bell. You'll get notified when uh, another video comes up. Uh, also subscribe on podbean.com uh, as well. All the links are going to be at the bottom. Um, I want to thank... Tara Lee for coming to the show today. We really appreciated having you today. Happy to be here. Yeah, it's great. Looking forward to having these conversations. All right, so we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna have Tara Lee back again, and we're gonna follow up and find out if uh, both her and us have uh, followed up on our own uh, our own plans. So, thanks everybody for joining us, and we'll talk to you next time. 3D Print the Future is sponsored by 3D PHC. Find them on the web at www.3dprintedhomescorporation.com.